chrome alveolata chrome alveolata is uh, uh, you know it's one of the very important kingdom by cavalier smith's classification so what is this chrome alveolata all about so it's a super kingdom chrome alveolata encompass kingdom chromista and alveolates right as per the name says uh, chrome alveolate uh, you know it is basically uh, an agglutination of the two separate words chrome and alveolate chrome uh, in latin means color so it's a result of the single secondary endosymbiosis between a line descending from bicond and a red algae progenitor of the chlorophyll c containing plastid so the chrome is caught uh, uh, chlorophyll c containing plastid from uh, this particular red algae you know the uh, ancestral red algae got, uh, became the food of an ancestral bicond eukaryote that is how the kingdom chromista came in existence so that is why it has got four membrane bound uh, you know chloroplast so chloroplast have got four layers kingdom chromista that is all about the straminopyle that is a brown algae brown colored algae the uh, mostly brown algae are uh, you know uh, macro algae you know seaweeds and brown algae is exclusively marine you see uh, plus phylum alveolates and also recently SAR group has been proposed phylogenetically right straminopiles alveolates and rhizarians so rhizarian from the uh, protozoa has been fixed into the chromist so uh, that is what I've already told you about the, the SAR supergroup in in plant systematics the hierarchy is that phyta ending is all about the phylum Physia ending is a class Ales ending is for the order and RCA ending is for the family. So with this guideline, so you can guess out which is, is it actually family or order, all those things, right? So in, inside the chrome alveolator, chromista and alveolate, these two are the major groups of the chrome alveolates. So chromista is a kingdom while alveolate is, uh, you know, unclassified group. So kingdom chromista has got uh, three major groups. One is haptophytes. That is coccolithophores, then cryptophyte, then straminopiles. You know, these three are the major groups of the chromista. So, haptophytes are coccolithophore, cryptophytes have got ejectosome. That's a very interesting parallel evolution. Uh, many unrelated organs, and both uh, animals and plants, have got this ejectosome. Uh, it's something that can be used like an arrow, you know, uh, a soldier. Uh, using an arrow to on the enemy's camp is just like that uh, something that can eject out like nidarians have this uh, like jellyfish the nidarians usually have this ejectosome uh, something that can actually uh, you know the, that can expel uh, onto the predator so it's actually a defensive in function so cryptophytes have ejectosome similarly ciliates also have got uh, you know ejectosome called trichocyst so these are all examples of the parallel evolution probably uh, in response to the adaptive constraints you see it's very interesting is that so straminopiles include heterocons and oomycetes so these two are the major uh, divisions inside straminopile so heterocont as the name says hetero means different cont like unicorn or bicont means flagella latin so heterocon means two flagella which are unequal in size that is why it's hetero heterotrophic uh, inside heterocon, you can see three main groups Bacillariophysia, that is diatoms, Chrysophysia, that is golden brown algae, and Phyophysia, that is a brown algae. These three are the major, uh, you know, groups within heterocons. Then we also have oomycetes inside Straminopyle. And coming to alveolata, the three major groups of alveolates are dinoflagellates, apicomplexans, and ciliates. As I told you, ciliates have got trichocysts, so which is like ejectosome, you know, something which can expel onto the predator. Let us see one by one. First is coccolithophore, that is a haptophyte, you know, coccolithophore. So coccolithophores, if you look uh, under the microscope, which is this this particular image is a scanning electron microscope, very high resolution. You can see that it is made up of uh, lots of shells, you know, just like a diatom, but this typically it has got a uh, you know a sphere like uh, shape with lots of small small test right there's a very famous coccolithophore called emiliana huxley 
very common in world's ocean, especially in tropical oceans. You know, this particular uh, coccolithophorus, uh, you can find it everywhere. This is a generalized figure of the coccolithophore cell. And you can see that number one here, this is called haptonema, you know, so that you can, uh, uh, that can pierce onto the predator. So haptonema is like a, uh, like an arrow, like a, a structure, which is not an injective zone though, right? Coccolithophore. So it has called haptonema. And also another very interesting characteristic is right here, a vacuole, number seven. This vacuole is a chrysolaminarin vacuole. So laminarin uh, is a, uh, it is basically a, a pigment present in laminaria. It's a kelp, you know, brown algae. So everything has got something similar because it's, it all belongs to the same chrome alveolata supergroup, right? So chrysolaminarin is a pigment and this vacuole contains chrysolaminarin. The vacuole contains it. So that is a speciality of the coccolithophore. By the way, coccolithophores play a tremendous role in ecology, global ecology, you know, ecology as well as global meteorology. See, meteorology is about the weather system, right? And monsoon, for example, coccolithophore, such a small unicellular, uh, you know, plants, uh, unicellular algae, in fact. Uh, how it can contribute in Indian monsoon system. Yeah, there are a lot of interesting curiosity driven explanations and studies on that lines as well. You know, so they thrive in warm seas and it releases a substance called DMS. That is a key. Uh, when it, uh, after the blooming of this Emiliana Huxley, uh, it start degrading, right? And when the cells start degrading, it releases this chemical called DMS, that is dimethyl sulfide. So this dimethyl sulfide is a cloud seeding molecule. This uh, particular gas goes to the upper atmosphere and then it can actually seed into the, uh, the cloud. You see, it can actually makes into, uh, I mean, the clouds can be formed because of the DMS. You see, it's just like uh, silver iodide that can be used, right? Fa my, one of my famous, uh, I mean, one of my favorite inventions by the uh, General, uh, General Electric. So they, they invented it just by the chance. It's a, a serendipitous discovery that silver iodide can uh, be used to seed, artificial seeding uh, the clouds to make the rains, you know, in uh, in those arid areas, right? So just like that, this is a natural seeding molecule, you know, the DMS. So uh, the nuclei help to produce a thicker cloud, especially the monsoon cloud because of the Emiliana Huxley. This is a paper in Cell Plus Eye Science. Infection dynamics of bloom forming alga and its virus determine the airborne coccolith emission from the seawater. So it's a viral disease of coccolithophores. By the way, all these eukaryotes are susceptible to various diseases, you know, the pathogenicity and virus, just like bacteriophages. So the several viruses can cause diseases in, uh, you know, the eukaryote, especially the unicellular eukaryotes and algae. So this paper is about viral disease on bloom forming coccolithophore. Very exciting piece and very less studied, right? Not many people are actually working on viral diseases of the protozoan. Protozoan itself is a, a highly neglected area, uh, you know, uh, in taxonomy and coming to its uh, viral diseases is very, very rare, rare kind of field, right? So phyocystis is a, 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 it's an excellent example of this coccolithophore. So phyocystis is, by the way, you can see it as a, uh, you know, form, uh, especially in uh, polluted uh, places, uh, you know, in, in the lakes, you can see this kind of form, right? So unpolluted places also, you can see the forms uh, due to the phyocystis bloom, you know? So uh, before the monsoon uh, time in South India, especially in Kerala and Tamil Nadu, you know, you know and uh, Maharashtra coast, you can, you can spot this kind of blooms coming up. So most probably these blooms are because of the phyocystis and other coccolithophores, you know. This is my own picture from Sander Cock Island, down south in Antarctica. So I was part of this Antarctic mission. So in this Sander Cock Island, I spotted the similar uh, form. You know, you can see that these are not eyes. These are actually the form. You can actually take out the form in your hand. And these forms can fly. Uh, you know, it could be an adaptation, you see. A wind-based uh, uh, you know, the seed dispersal uh, adaptation in the phyocystis. So this is phyocystis Antarctica, first report from the freshwater ecosystem 
it could be very well be a new species too the students are working on this in my lab so here you can see this is Santa Cork Islands uh, it's basically a freshwater uh, you know ecosystem and more than that this is an oligotrophic uh, organism I mean uh, environment the ecosystem is oligotrophic not at all any nutrients It's a pure fresh water unlike Yamuna River in, if you ever been to the Delhi Yamuna River highly polluted right or Alsur Lake in, in Bangalore you can see this kind of form but those forms might be because of the surfactants but here there is no pollution right Antarctic lakes have got no pollutants and still you can see that this kind of form so probability is very high that it's because of the coccolithophores, the blooming of the coccolithophores. So coming to the phylogenetic relationship between all these uh, uh, chrome alveolates, you can see the alveolates and straminopiles are the major divisions. So straminopile uh, or, or the chromist, right? So that is uh, the two are interchangeable synonyms, right? So inside alveolates, you can see dinoflagellate, apicomplex and ciliates. These three are the major groups in which dinoflagellates and apicomplexins together form one clade then ciliates so these two are more related so dinoflagellates and apicomplexins are very important animal pathogens right so dinoflagellate example include feasteria and carenia so feasteria is a fish pathogenic uh, dinoflagellate and carenia carenia brevis is a brevi toxin which is a neurotoxin so carenia is basically a harmful algal bloom a hazardous algal bloom you know HAB it's an algal bloom that spreads in you know uh, uh, thousands of hectares in ocean right and if you ever consume the shellfish or the fish from those polluted area you are susceptible for the neurotoxicity so because of the brevi toxin you know so and apicomplexins example include plasmodium and toxoplasma very very important uh, human pathogen you know plasmodium vivax malarial parasite and toxoplasma gondii you know uh, that we will see it in a short while ciliates include paramecium a very important ciliate that we, we studied in our school days isn't it so straminopiles include two main group heterocont and oomycetes heterocont has got three major groups Bacillariophyceae, Chrysophyceae, and Phyophyceae. Bacillariophyceae include diatoms, examples are uh, Thalassioria and uh, Phyodactylum. These are example genus of the diatoms. Chrysophyceae is golden uh, algae, example is Dinobryon. By the way, golden algae is one of the group which is completely avoided by most of the taxonomies. Not many uh, taxonomies are working on the golden algae. So there is a huge uh, opportunities are there. So, you know, if you ever want to pursue on a rare uh, but ecologically important and abundant taxonomic group, come on, pursue on golden algae for your PhD. Why not? A uh, lot of opportunities are there for golden algae studies. And Phyophyceae is about brown algae, very common in world's oceans. You know, seaweeds, the brown seaweeds are all brown algae. So, Fucus is an example of a, a very common brown seaweed. Coming finally to the heterocons oomycete, which is a, a plant pathogenic, uh, uh, you know, group. Phytophthora is an example of these oomycetes. So, straminopiles uh, include several groups of heterotroph as well as certain groups of the algae, you know. So, most straminopiles have got two flagella. Uh, that is, one is hairy tinsel flagella, you know, this flagella is hairy, right? And the other one is basically smooth whiplash flagellum. I suggest you to check it out in the YouTube. There are so many interesting videos on how these two flagella actually works. You know, animations uh, can give you a better idea how it works. You know, there's a very interesting locomotion in the straminopiles. So heterocond, as the word says in Latin, hetero, two flagella of unequal size, right? And if you look at the chloroplast, it has got chlorophyll A, C, and accessory pigment fucoxanthin. Uh, that name fuco is from the fucus, very famous uh, heterocond. It's a it's a uh, brown algae, brown seaweed, fucus. So fucoxanthin is an accessory pigment that gives a brown color to this uh, heterocons. You know, so Bacillariophyceae is diatoms, uh, which could be marine or freshwater. Chrysophyceae is golden brown algae, very less studied group, okay? And all these are freshwater, while Phyophyceae, brown algae are exclusively marine, very interesting feature of this brown seaweeds. 
So heterocons include diatoms, golden algae and brown algae. This is how the diatom looks like so beautiful. Uh, diatoms are really beautiful. We will cover uh, more about diatoms in one of our later uh, lectures. Then the golden algae, I told you it's very less studied and brown algae. This picture is uh, macrocyst is pyrifera from an aquarium. You see they have a very big aquarium. Uh, by the way, this picture, I took this picture from Monterey Bay Aquarium, one of the oldest aquarium. Yes, this is the oldest aquarium in the US. You know, uh, Monterey Bay Aquarium is in the California. Uh, during my 2009 trip, you know, so this uh, the standard Stanford University has got the uh, marine lab uh, housed, uh, you know, in the proximity to the uh, this particular aquarium, Monterey Bay Aquarium. That is why I went there. So this uh, algae is uh, it's, it's basically a seaweed called Macrocystis pyrifera or kelp. It's a very very big. It can form a clonal uh, forest, you know, that can uh, that can actually uh, cover a large expanses of the ocean surface thousands of hectares you know so in that sense this is the biggest organism in the world you know really exhaustive isn't it so these are the examples of the heterocon we will cover one by one in later stage oh my see this is the last example of this um, uh, you know this particular group isn't it um, yeah oh my seed is a fungus like filamentous eukaryote also known as water mold you know water mold so it's saprophytic or pathogenic saprophytic means just like fungus it can absorb the uh, the you know the nutrients from uh, the outside and uh, environment isn't it it can just absorb it nutrients just like mushrooms or uh, fungus so phytophthora infestans is a notorious uh, plant pathogenic uh, uh, you know uh, uh, organism right micro so it was the major culprit of 1845 irish potato famine you know potato uh, devastation of the potato farms in the ireland so late potato blight the, the causative agent of late potato blight is phytophthora infestans phytophthora ramorum is another example of omicide it causes sudden oak death in the oak trees around the world so that is also a very important uh, pathogenic organism 